as most people know, the United States has uh, sort of food recommendations. They're made by a dietary advisory group and then adopted by Health and Human Services. And, uh, and you know, now that there is a food czar at the White House, that they are actually involved as well. And um, it turns out that uh, 2015 was one of the times where every, every five years they're supposed to come out with a document. So they actually came out with a document that had some significant concerns uh, for us, and um, that also had some really marvelously informative uh, uh, data, uh, sort of a compilation for coffee, for example, where uh, they looked at the studies and uh, really said that coffee, if anything, is a benefit. And I thought mo think most of us have heard that it's good, and then it's bad, and then it's good, and then it's bad, and it just keeps coming and going. But you know, if there really is data out there, uh, and there is, indicating that it decreases cardiovascular disease, stroke, and, and diabetes. And if you do four cups a day, which is almost un unconsumable from my point of view, um, then we have to give some respect to that. Now, they also said some really good stuff about the amount of sugar that the American population is eating and how that needs to be reined in completely. Uh, they also talk about decreasing the amount of red meat and saturated fat. Uh, so we agree with that completely. The problem is their uh, recommendations on cholesterol. It turns out that in the past, they've put a limit, a suggested limit of 300 milligrams, which is a, a little less than an egg and a half, you know, one, in, in, because there's so much uh, cholesterol in an egg yolk. And it turns out that um, if you ate your egg and a half, then no more cholesterol the rest of the day, you probably are getting uh, some other things that are not so, so bad as, as well. You'd be decreasing your saturated fat uh, intake and, and your total fat intake as well. But it turns out that they want to remove that 300 milligram limit. And the, you could make an argument for that scientifically, and they did, and, but the ar arguments that they used were two articles that I just couldn't agree with. One was our own guidelines, which we had all read uh, carefully and signed off on. Um, and you know, guidelines do change, and that guidelines have to be informed by everything that's published after the cutoff date. For our particular guidelines on, on lifestyle, <clears throat> uh, the cutoff date was July 2013, so anything that's published after that, you won't see um, changing the recommendations. And so there have been subsequent analyses that say uh, very clearly that ingestion of cholesterol increases serum cholesterol. Uh, until that point, if you use the literature from 1998 to 2013, which was how this was done, you miss the fact that there uh, was data before that, which was uh, considered to be you know, really not the kind of evidence that you'd like to use based on trial design and old trial design and the new stuff. And so um, you could come to the conclusion, which we did, that we need more data, and that the relationship wasn't clear. And that's what our document says. It doesn't say there is no relationship. And the dietary advisory group said that we said there's no relationship between ingested cholesterol and the serum cholesterol. Um, that, I felt, was not a correct interpretation of the wording of our guidelines. Um, they had a second reference, which was even more interesting. It actually was a compilation of, I believe, 16 studies that looked at, uh, that qualified to be in this meta-analysis by comparing two groups that were fairly similar, that is, one egg or less per week ingested versus a group of people who would eat um, one egg per day or more, that's seven per week. Now, the problem with each of those studies is that it never really goes into detail in terms of, if they're not eating the eggs, what are they eating? Okay, and so a person, and how long have they been eating this dietary pattern, which is really a key issue. We know from, you know, vegetarian studies uh, in Great Britain that in order to have a real effect, you could, you know, sure the Esselstyn diet might get your angina to go away in three weeks, and the Ornish diet might sh show regression of plaque over one in five years in his JAMA articles, but to have the overall, if, you, if you're not looking at surrogate markers, you're looking at mortality, you need at least you know, sort of a five-year period of I'm, I am a vegan now that I've been a vegan for five years. I expect to have some result from that. So it turns out that um, they did have the time period, you know, six to 22 years um, of follow-up, but nothing at the onset for each of those studies about how long a person had been following in that dietary pattern. So that'd be point number one. Point number two is uh, what else were they eating? So if I'm 
saying, you know, I really don't like these eggs. I think that eggs are bad for me. So instead of having two strips of bacon and two eggs, I'm going to skip the eggs and do four strips of bacon. Well, that puts me in the low egg group, but it doesn't put me in a healthier diet group. And so to take those two very diverse populations, one eating one egg a week or less versus seven or more uh, per week, and compare them, you're going to get a variety of responses, okay, based on who's actually in those trials. It's not the, the kind of prospective uh, study design that you would want as a scientist. So anyway, uh, if you add up those 16 studies, they came to the conclusion that there was no appreciable difference in uh, ischemic heart disease, that's uh, dying of a heart attack, um, or overall cardiovascular disease. The problem was that they did notice that if you were in the high egg eating group, even though there are all these variables, and even though a person may have switched from eggs to, to more bacon, that it increased the amount of diabetes uh, by 42%. And if you were a diabetic at the onset of the trial, you did have a cardiovascular disease burden, an increase in cardiovascular events of 69% in the diabetic population eating eggs versus those who don't. So this data would not be the kind of data that I would use to tell the American population, go ahead. We have a rising tide of diabetes. This would contribute to it, and it also would take the, the diabetics and put a cardiovascular burden on there that they really don't need. So the question has come up whether or not the study that I just talked about, uh, or several studies, because this was a meta-analysis, the 16 studies, if, whether they were actually funded by Egg Board, which I have heard that they are, but I'm not thinking that this was what they were looking for, because it showed a 69% increase in cardiovascular events in the diabetic population. That's not something that if I were promoting a product, that I would put that out there and push this data to everyone because it, it impugns um, my product, in this case, eggs. So I'm, you know, I'm not so concerned that, uh, that the science was tainted because it shows kind of what I personally would have thought it would show, that the eating a high amount of eggs is actually damaging. Um, you know, there's this, you know, the concept that eating this stuff sort of hurts beta cells and that's why they're developing di diabetics or diabetes, that may be true. But certain, certainly, if you are diabetic, um, you're going to have an event if you're eating that diet. And so, you know, in relationship with industry, uh, it, it backfired if that's what they were trying to, <laughs> trying to show.